Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Is that us? Are we, and I'm thinking particularly of those of us uh, who live in the West, the U.S., or other countries like it, are we persecuted? And if we are, how bad? More importantly, if we are, how are we supposed to respond? More importantly, what if that response ends up being quite costly and quite strange and quite wonderful? Greatest teacher who ever lived said, your problems, the opposition to you are not insurmountable. What is insurmountable is God and his kingdom. And therefore you can make this a golden rule day. We've been looking together at the Beatitudes and now we come to the eighth, the final one. And that actually bookends them. You might remember they began, Jesus began, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then a series of other Beatitudes where the promise is put in the future. Uh, the, those who mourn will be comforted, the meek will inherit the earth. Then we come around to verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is, present tense again, the kingdom of heaven. So this is the great bookend. Life in the kingdom of heaven is the great blessing that comes to every human being, people, including people who are thought to be uh, losers. The good life is coming to you. But in this last beatitude, now Jesus goes further. And he puts it now with the second person. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Then what should I do? Rejoice. Be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven. Now notice he doesn't say your reward will be great someday after you die. The kingdom of heaven is right here. And there's goodness at work and available right here. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, how do we know if we're being persecuted for righteousness sake? As you may know, quite a lot is written in our day about Christians, particularly in America. And is there kind of a persecution complex, almost a kind of a paranoia? There's a, a writer named Alan Noble who wrote this. If we as Christians want to have a persuasive voice in a pluralistic culture, we have to discern accurately when we are victims of true persecution and when it is only imagined or when it is greatly exaggerated. Now, back in Jesus' day, persecution was very clearly going on. Jesus and his own disciples were persecuted by religious leaders, culminating in his death on the cross by the religious leaders and by Rome, who then persecuted others. Stephen was martyred and James and Saul was a part of that. And then the disciples were scattered and then eventually, by the time you get to the Roman Emperor Nero, uh, there is a periodic, quite widespread, quite violent persecution of Christians. That is part of their life. Even then, they recognize the need to discern, when am I suffering for righteousness sake, as opposed to simply at random, or because I did something wrong? Uh, Peter writes this in 1 Peter, If you're insulted in the name of Christ, this is chapter 4, you're blessed. Well, the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal, and then lest you think you're off the hook yet, or even as a meddler. You ever meddle? Christians ever get involved in meddling and judging and getting into other people's business inappropriately and sticking their noses where they don't belong? Now, even, even if you're doing that, Peter says, no credit to you for that. That's not suffering for righteousness sake. He says in chapter 2, if you're punished for doing wrong, there's no reason to praise you for uh, bearing that kind of punishment. So there's a discernment process. I think in the 20th century, there was a very conservative, avowedly Christian college that uh, would not allow black students into their student body. And they said it was for their understanding of the Bible and theological reasons. And when they experienced pressure, about that from the government and others, they interpreted that as we're being persecuted because we're Christian. No, it was just bad theology. On the other hand, I think of a woman that I know who saw a great injustice, great wrong that was done and battled courageously for years and eventually was able to bring it to light and to bring some measure of justice. And she just got hammered for doing that. Now that is um, suffering for a righteous cause. And that may happen in our lives for any number of reasons. Um, as we think about 
uh, Christianity in our culture, in our society, I, I think really two things are true at the same time. Christians are still a majority in America. We have never had a president who uh, was a religion other than Christianity, never had an atheist or somebody who adhered to another religion. On the other hand, one of the things that we sense and struggle to wrestle with is becoming what is sometimes called a cognitive minority. That for people in kind of culturally elite gatekeeping institutions, uh, higher academia or in the media, Christianity is pretty significantly underrepresented there. And so we wonder, well, how should we respond? There was a HBO series a while ago called um, Silicon Valley. And one of the co-founders of this fictional startup was outed as being a Christian. And somebody else at the company said, you know, you can be openly polyamorous and people will call you brave. You can put microdoses of LSD in your cereal and people will call you a pioneer. The one thing you cannot be is a Christian. And folks will feel that sometimes. On the other hand, there'll be people like Pat Gelsinger, who is the CEO of Intel, or Ron Johnson, who is the creator of Apple stores in a place like Silicon Valley that are very open about their faith, man, have fabulous careers there. So uh, I think the, the key question, no matter how we interpret this, is how do we respond um, when we suffer for seeking to do the right thing? How do we respond to the fact that Christian, the Christian faith uh, is clearly in decline, at least in the U.S.? And this is quite fascinating. This is from a book that's been quite broadly read, The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory. And in it, the author talks about a man named John Dixon, who's from Australia. He comes to speak at a conference in the U.S. at Wheaton College. With Christians soon to be in a minority in the United States, the question should not be how best to fight back and reclaim our lost status. Rather, this uh, Christian academician, John Dixon from Australia, said the question should be how Christians might lose well, hmm. carrying themselves in ways that reflect the hope and confidence and great love found in the gospel. At present, Dixon said, the American church is suffering from bully syndrome, too many Christians are swaggering around, picking on marginalized people, generally acting like jerks because they're angry and apprehensive. Every teacher will tell you the bully on the playground is usually the most insecure boy. It's the same with the church. The bully church is the insecure church. Uh, Russell Moore, who's now the uh, editor of Christianity Today, um, uh talked about how um, multiple pastors have come to him and have said when they say to their congregations, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek, and then we'll have people come up to them afterwards and say, where did you get those weak liberal talking points? And when they say, actually, it's Jesus, they will be, t they will, they, 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 the, the other person doesn't apologize and say, oh gosh, I didn't realize that was Jesus. I'm sorry. I was, well, uh, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, it's too weak. So uh, Dixon goes on in this talk. He asked the crowd to remember how Paul was unjustly jailed in the ancient Macedonian city of Philippi, and his response was to sing hymns because he recognized that what looked like losing, suffering, difficulty, problem, was actually going to end up being a win for the cause of Jesus and for the sake of the gospel. To lose well does not mean to accept mediocrity or aim at failure in business or to be passive or not to try to correct injustices. To lose well means to follow the way of the cross. It means I give up making my little agenda, my particular interests, my well-being, my or our status in our society, my number one goal. And if there are people who are troubling or irritating or hard for me, I seek to love them really well. I am willing to let go of my position, my status, my finances, what people say about me, my reputation. I'm willing to let that go to seek to follow Jesus. There's a kind of mindset that says, um, 
you know, for Christianity to flourish, we got to make sure that we have Christians, our kind of people, in the right positions of power. How strange it is that over the centuries when the church has been at its best, it's not been in the times when it has had most power and the ability to coerce or persecute others. It's when the church has had least power and suffers persecution with radiant joy. Rejoice and be glad. When I was in Ethiopia decades ago under a Marxist regime, I remember asking one of the Christians who had been in prison several times, uh, how do you pray for the suffering to stop? And his response was, why would I pray for suffering to stop? Because the church is advancing in such glorious ways. Life is not about getting higher on the social to uh, pecking order. So today, lose well. That doesn't mean aim at mediocrity or failure or be passive. Let go. If there's somebody who's troubling you, um, love them. Find a way to serve them. It's a strange thing for me being involved in pastoral ministry. I can still find myself tempted to compare myself to this person. And so the opportunity is when somebody does great, preaches great, writes great, to pull for them, to want them to do really well, to pray and ask for them to shine and help cheer them on. I have a friend who's a philosopher. He got a letter from somebody on the other side of the world not long ago and said, for 20 years, you've been my enemy. He didn't even know he had an enemy. Um, but to say, well, what can I learn from you? Instead of being defensive, uh, how can you become my teacher? Today, on the road, in finances, in time, lose well. Make it a golden rule day. If you like hearing John talk about the Sermon on the Mount, we've got a whole series on that. So go ahead and subscribe to make sure you don't miss any future episodes in that series. You can also go back and catch up on any episodes that you may have missed. Now, if you're interested in the email or the text alert that goes along with each episode, you can let us know at becomenew.com slash subscribe, and we'll make sure that you get those. If you want to help us spread the word about Become New, the best way to do it is just to watch, like, and comment each video that we put out. So we would love to hear your thoughts. If you want to chime in in the comments, that would help us and we'd love to engage with you there. Lastly, if you've got a prayer request, there's a group of us who meet each weekday to pray for viewers just like yourself. You can send us your prayer request to the number 855-888-0444 and we would love to pray for you. We'll catch you next time.